Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 17th, 2018, and my guest is historian and author Janet Golden. She is professor of history at Rutgers University, where she specializes in the history of medicine, history of childhood, women's history, and American social history. Her latest book, which is the topic of today's conversation, is Babies Made Us Modern, How Infants Brought Americans into the 20th Century. Janet, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. This book's a really um, fascinating portrait of, of a piece of American social history, which, of course, many of us are aware of in general outline. We know that the way we treat babies and the way they treat us has changed over the last hundred years, but your book really brings home how incredibly dramatic that that change has been in a relatively short period of time. And in creating that portrait, uh, talk about what your goals were and how you went about finding the information that you share in the book, your methodology. Because you look at some sources that uh, economists certainly don't usually look at and uh, even some historians don't get to. Thanks. Uh I started this book originally with a friend of mine, and we thought we'd write a kind of a fun, happy commercial book. And then she had to drop the project because she was busy being a dean at a university. And the more I kept digging into readings about children, into finding fun stuff about babies, the more I realized uh, infants are truly economic actors. They really bring Americans into the world of commercial culture, into um, uh, modern psychology, into familiarity with advertising. And the way I discovered that was truly serendipitous. I was talking with a colleague at the History of Medicine meetings, and he said, you know, here at UCLA, we have a collection of baby books, books that mothers filled in day after day, year after year. Sometimes they made a few entries, sometimes they made a lot. And he gets online every day and he buys baby books on eBay. And so they've amassed uh, several thousand in their collection. And they're truly a wonderful source about everything. I could have I could have written another three books about what they had to say, uh, but I had to stop myself. And um, I, I will say that I did put my children's baby books in that archive as well, because I thought it was such a terrific collection. Um, But. For economists, I think the story of babies is just wonderful. I didn't realize it when I started, but uh, babies are really all about connecting their families to the modern economy in the 20th century. And uh, I didn't expect to find so much about banking, insurance, finance, purchasing, but that's what they're all about. Yeah, and the vast amount of advice given by a vast array of interested and sometimes disinterested observers is it's pretty daunting i assume i mean you accumulated a huge amount of information i did i tried to stay away from saying too much about the advice to parents of which there's a vast literature and instead record what the parents had to say about their infants and of course uh, People didn't always obey the advice. Let's put it that way. They <laughs> yeah. uh, they fed their babies things they that baby advisors would say is not a good idea. Uh, my favorite uh, anecdote in there is, of course, the one about the baby who's a uh, baby book that said, "Today I smoked my first cigarette," <laughs> <laughs> and then he added, uh, "21 years later, I'm still smoking." <laughs> Woohoo! So, yeah, so you you find a lot of fascinating material in there, or the the seven month old baby who had the full Thanksgiving meal, the turkey, the stuffing, the cranberry sauce, lots and lots of really fascinating material about how babies really live, not about how they were supposed to live. Yeah, that, that cigarette story reminds me of when my wife was uh, shopping with our 
our daughter who was maybe, I don't know, six months old at the time. And she ran into a friend and then she went and grabbed something from a shelf. She came back to see our daughter uh, smiling the the most uh, ecstatic smile. And that's because this other woman that my wife had ran into had given her her first piece of chocolate, (laughs) which my wife was not happy about. But my daughter sure was. I don't know about that first cigarette, but uh, that there is a lot of um, serendipitous stuff going on in life like that, inevitably. Right. Right. And and the other fun thing about it uh, is that you get to see how immigrant folk ways and food ways really come to America. Um, So, uh, well, historians find that uh, medical advisors used to complain a lot about Italian immigrants. Here they are. They're feeding their children fresh fruits and vegetables. Isn't that terrible? (laughs) Um, And of course, nowadays that's what we're supposed to be eating so it's kind of fun to see how the uh, babies uh, and their immigrant parents uh, really change america that way as well yeah, i was struck uh, a number of things struck me while reading the book that i hope we'll get we'll get to talk about one of them was just how dramatically uh, life has changed and for for mothers in particular and for babies in particular of course by Along the way, for fathers and siblings and and society at large, but this one sentence just struck me as a dramatic example. It says, "As a scholarly study of Buffalo, New York's Italian community at the turn of the century explained, sixty to eighty nine percent of women over thirty had lost at least one child, and among Polish women in the city, the rate was nearly as high. The rate of infant mortality was was it's just hard for us to relate to how." perilous life was, and we'll get into the particulars of why it was particularly perilous, but it's it's just hard to remember. Obviously, women died at a much more fearsome rate in childbirth, but the infant mortality rate is just, uh, it's just shocking how, how high it was, and, and you, it, make, it makes you reflect on what that must have done to, to life and how people dealt with it and thought about it, and, and it's just... Um, Incredibly powerful. It is. It is a truly a, a triumph of the 20th century that uh, in the developed world we've been able to so drama- dramatically lower our infant mortality rate, and a lot of that really began in the late 19th century, of course, with things like clean water supplies. Uh, later on, with uh, milk pasteurization laws, uh, with Uh, sewage and sanitation, sort of the big infrastructure projects uh, that we've that we've mostly forgotten about, um, but really had a dramatic effect on infant lives, children's lives, life expectancy. Uh, And then the second phase of that really comes in the 20th century when we began uh, giving people pretty sound advice about infant care around the idea of let's let's uh, get rid of germs, let's avoid germs, uh, let's keep uh, milk clean or refrigerated. Pretty basic ideas that are second nature to us now, but but really had to be taught to people. Yeah, we're, and we'll, we'll talk about that. It, it, I found that ex- extremely interesting. I just want to mention in passing that I may have mentioned this problem once before. No, nah, I didn't. I think it was on different pro, different activity of mine, but uh, it's called The First Snowfall by James Russell Lowell, and we'll put a link up to it. And it's one of my favorite sentimental poems. It's really an extraordinary uh, piece of uh, sentimentality, very powerful. And it makes you wonder, as, with, as your data also makes me wonder, just how people felt about the loss of an infant. It was common. Uh, so it wasn't uh, – in, in some dimension, it was it, – it's, it's tempting to think it, it was not as big a tragedy – as it is now because it was common, and yet it obviously was incredibly painful and heartrending. And at the same time, as our, the other part of your book I wanted you to talk about on, while we're ta- discussing this is the, the ability and necessity sometimes for women to sell their children for financial uh, reasons or to abandon them. The whole phenomenon of, of a foundling, which is a common motif in you know movies of set around – the late 19th century uh, is it, just so alien to us. The idea of discovering – you still read about it once in a while, uh, 
an abandoned baby is found in a train station somewhere, and it makes a, it's a big news story. But in, in the ninth, late 19th and early 20th centuries, it, it was, I wouldn't call it commonplace, but it was not a rarity. Talk about that. Um, abandonment has had a long history, of course, and in, in Europe, all of our hospitals that began for children were really began as foundling asylums uh, run by religious orders where people would drop off unwanted infants. Uh, in the United States, we also had foundling hospitals. And today we even, I know a number of uh, fire stations say, have a sign saying you can drop off an unwanted infant here, no questions asked. Um, but it was much more common in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century for women to um, abandon their infants on the steps of police stations, um, in front of churches. It was it wasn't an everyday occurrence, but it it happened quite a bit. And the um, infants would be sent to institutions where the mortality rate, as I talk about, was close to 100 percent. They just didn't have the means to care for them. They didn't have the means to feed them. And then, of course, once a baby had an infection, it would spread from crib to crib and they might all die very quickly. So. That was a problem. Later on in the 20th century, infants go from being unwanted uh, to being highly desirable. Yeah, yeah. Desperately wanted. <laughs> Desperately wanted, especially, of course, if they're not disabled and they are white. Uh, so we get into a different kind of marketplace, one that economists don't, probably don't talk enough about, and that is what will you pay for a baby? How do you go about buying one? What will you pay for one? And that's something the Kefauver hearings in the 50s really brought to light. It was quite a booming industry. Um, uh, Sub Rosa, black market, illegal, quasi-legal. And the thing that impressed me most that really brought that home to me was a story in the New York Times about a a mob organization that engaged in baby buying and selling. and, And the the, the traditional racketeering was kind of a secondary enterprise for them. So uh, that tells you about how much money got in, involved in that. Uh, I think today there's probably some of that going on. Uh, I don't really study the, the world after the baby boomers, but um, babies are highly prized now. That's not to say they're not still abandoned. Uh, and it's not to say that all babies are highly prized, but they really are, again, a part of the marketplace that we don't like to talk about. People used to pay to give them up to baby farmers who would kind of quickly dispatch them. And now we pay to buy them, in a sense, uh, from adoption brokers. Talk about what a baby farmer is. And it's a terrible phrase. Uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, ugly phrase, but it's, um, it, was a, it was a thing. And you said dispatch. So clarify that and tell us, tell us about baby farmers. Baby farmers, and that was a, a, a well-known phrase at one point, were women, often older women with no other means of earning an income, who took in babies to care for them full time. Uh, some of them were well-meaning women who helped out other women who had to go to work in domestic service. Uh, others engaged in a kind of understanding that the babies might not live. And when municipal authorities or newspaper reporters would do investigations of these baby farmers, uh, they would find that they'd either taken in the babies and then sent them to the the poorhouse or the baby uh, to the infant asylum to die, or that their backyards were were filled with them. Um, where they dug up the backyard and put the bodies in there. Uh, so these babies would be, were not likely to live. Um, but you could kind of, I guess, soothe your conscience by saying, I didn't abandon my baby on the courthouse steps. I paid somebody to take it in. But you, you must have known that whether it was a baby farmer who was going to take good care of the baby or was a baby farmer who would uh, oversee the child's burial. Uh, there were a lot of lot of investigations, attempts to outlaw this. Um, but ironically, when you took babies away from baby farmers and sent them directly to institutions, uh, they didn't fare any better. Yeah, you I, really I, needed a better system of, of what we'll call foster care to make sure that those unwanted infants lived. 
Yeah, I couldn't help but think about Cosette and the Thanerdeers and Les Mis, but um, and you always think, well, well, that's kind of a harsh portrait, but you know, maybe not so inaccurate. Um, it was just hard to keep babies alive. I want to talk more about that, but one piece of that, which you talked about in the book, which I knew nothing about, which is utterly fascinating, is infant incubator displays. Uh, so talk about what those were and um, how they evolved. It's really crazy. Uh, well, it's crazy, but it's fascinating, isn't it? Yep. Infant incubators. We think of incubators for hatching eggs and uh, not for already hatched babies, uh, but there they were. They're basically... Uh, glass and metal boxes that kept babies warm and isolated so they weren't exposed to germs. Uh, they took they were for premature infants. Some of them would be fed by a, a milk drop a dropper filled with milk or uh, some other kind of tube feeding cared for by nurses. But how do you pay for that expensive care? Well, you put the babies on display at a state fair or at a World's Fair where they begin in in the United States in 1898 in the Trans-Mississippi Exhibition. But they appear at every other World's Fair. Um, People pay a quarter to go in and look at the babies, and that money helps pay for their care. Uh, And the last of them survives uh, until World War II on Coney Island, New York, where it was said that some women sort of had a favorite baby and they'd pay every day to go in and look at it and see how it was doing. Um, but eventually, as we know, big incubators become hospital technologies in those neonatal intensive care units. So it's you don't have to pay to see them anymore. And uh, we, we think of those medical technologies not as display items. Uh, the best place to get a sense of that is when we had the TV show Boardwalk Empire, if you remember that. Uh, The mayor of Atlantic City, Nucky Thompson, would go down to the boardwalk and look at the the babies in the incubators there. It was kind of a a wonderful TV moment um, teaching us a little bit of history because Martin Scorsese does a lot of research for all of his uh, historic work. So, yes, we had baby incubators and uh, uh, they were they were display items. I I don't know if you know any have any relatives who grew up in uh, New York or on the New Jersey boardwalk in Atlantic City, but your older relatives might remember seeing the babies. It's just the weirdest thing. I mean, they're, they're, uh, you quote a, a young boy who goes through the exhibit <laughs> and is just a little bit disappointed <laughs> that they don't do anything. Uh, you know, it reminds me of when you go to the zoo and the, the lions are asleep. Now, at least you saw one, but it's not doing anything. And you do want some action. The <laughs> amount of action you can get from a baby in an incubator is highly limited. It's just there's not much to hope for there. But as you point out, I, I, one number I wanted to read, you said at the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, California, the incubator display took in $72,000, which is nearly $1.7 million in today's dollars. I mean, it's just – it's extraordinary that I don't think – you know, it's not like um, – it's not a Barnum thing, but but people paid to see them. Well, let's go back and think about what you asked me about earlier. We had an incredibly high infant mortality rate. And the greatest driver of infant mortality then and now is prematurity. So if you can find a way to keep premature infants alive, you're you're striking at something that every family, every person has probably experienced or heard about. So to just go and see these simple boxes that probably look like the incubator for the chicks on the farm where you grew up and say, but yes, it's keeping the babies alive. That would seem marvelous to you, even though those babies uh, weren't doing anything too interesting. They weren't performers. I like that point. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Of course, as you point out, most of them didn't stay alive for very long. So it was a, it was not, we weren't really very good at figuring out how to keep them, those premature infants alive. Well, the ones in incubators uh, had a, we think they fudge the data on how many survive, but they did pretty well in part because of their own little boardwalk trick. And that is by the time the infants got there, the weakest ones probably died. Uh, and then they might not put them on display if they were look like they were likely to die. So Good you point. kind of put the fighters in there. They did survive. Um, And uh, you could go back day after day and see them growing a little bit uh, until they finally get discharged. 
So it was a little, yes, it was a little bit of uh, boardwalk trickery, but you got to see something that mattered to, to, to just about every American. They knew they'd lost siblings. Their parents told them about lost siblings. Um, they knew people who lost babies. So what a wonderful piece of technology to gaze at. Yeah, that's that's cool. Even though there wasn't like as we said now, not that much going on. The other piece of the of the uh, infant mortality uh, puzzle, which I again never thought about. I knew I knew how horrific the, the data, the numbers were for say 1900. Uh, I hadn't thought much about why they fell so dramatically. And part of the reason is that in 1900 we were really bad at keeping milk cold, um, and so the summer was a particular in hot climate, uh, the summer was a particularly dangerous time to be an infant. The summer was deadly. Um, they were just babies dying all the time in the heat. Uh, they'd get an infection. Um, they'd spread it to others in the household and they would die. But the milk was a real problem. Once you, And that's why they told women not to wean their babies in the summer. If you're breastfeeding, keep it on till keep doing it until the cool weather comes. Because if you think about it, it's a long way from the cow to the urban infant. You got to collect the milk. Maybe the cans you collected in have some germs. They're not cleaned out well. You put them on the wagon to take them to the milk depot at the train. Um, they sit in the hot sun waiting for the train. They sit on the train. They get to town to the milk seller. And the milk seller sit by then says, gee, that smells pretty bad. Let me add some water, some adulterants to cover up the smell. By the time you go and buy that loose milk, it's not too good. And even if you buy pretty good loose milk, if you don't have a way to keep it cold, if you can't afford the ice for the ice box, it's not going to do too well. If you don't have any running water in your tenement to clean those bottles, you're going to grow bacteria in them. Uh, so it's a, it's a challenge feeding babies. So in the summer, babies died of what we called summer complaint, which were these milk-borne bacterial illnesses. In the winter, we have different problems, and that's the respiratory illnesses that spread, as, as they still do in the winter. And just it's interesting that, and I, maybe I missed this. I know there's different uh, moments where in the book where you talk about, say, solid foods. When the advice that parents are given about when to adopt solid foods and what kind, uh, zwieback, which is one of my favorite words, you don't see that very often, <laughs> gets mentioned at least twice in your book, maybe more. Um, and and when I hear that word, I, I I think you have to be old enough. To, to appreciate. I don't know if you can, if anybody still buys Zwieback, or I'm sure they still make it somewhere. We'll have but, to look that one up. Yeah. But uh, it's a certain kind of thick cracker that is just, um, I can smell it right now. Uh, but you'd think that this challenge with milk would have not just encouraged uh, uh, breastfeeding through the summer months, but, but breastfeeding for a long time. And I find it interesting that obviously the commercial interests of Formula makers and the milk industry uh, encourage the adaptation of uh, milk and formula. It just I found it interesting to think about why women didn't breastfeed a lot longer uh, th than I think than I think they did. I think if, I might be wrong. Maybe they did. I don't, again, I don't remember anywhere in the book where you talked about it. But I think the impression I get is that women were eager to get their babies onto milk and formula relative to in the 19, early 1900s relative to today. And I wondered, what, given that the, the dangers of milk, why that didn't, uh, why they didn't delay that a little bit longer in those days? Or do I have the facts wrong? It's, it's really a social class phenomenon. Uh, wealthier women, middle class women would wean their babies or even start their babies initially on bottle feeding with maybe with a day nurse. Um, poor families, immigrant families, uh, breastfed for a lot longer, in part because it did function uh, for a while as birth control. Yep. Um, but it also what happens in poorer families, if, if you do have a large family, if you've just given birth to baby number five or six and you have three or four living children to take care of and you're washing those diapers by hand, you're uh, keeping the farm going, you're going out to, to work or your, your husband's getting laid off from work and you've got to go out and do domestic service, 
you really don't have the luxury to keep on breastfeeding. So uh, there are different issues for different classes of women. But uh, the medical community was very incensed about upper class, middle class women who did not breastfeed. They knew it was best. And yet they were also the ones prescribing the formulas. So it's kind of a conundrum there. They knew what was best, but their their clients, their patients didn't want it. So they helped them get the uh, formulas. Preparing baby food is a cha- was a challenge. You had to take those vegetables and uh, mash them or puree them themselves. And that's why uh, apocryphally, uh, Mrs. Gerber said to her husband, you know, putting these peas through this strainer is too hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so from being a food company to be a baby food company, um, as they discover that there's a real market for already made baby food. I like that argument that there was a prestige, I guess, to uh, not breastfeeding to show you're wealthy enough that you could afford to buy the milk or hire uh, someone to to feed the baby. Um, and uh, now I'm getting – I really wish you had mentioned the Gerber pee thing. I think that's worth worse since we back. I, I remember – I have a vivid memory of, of my little – my little brother uh, going through those little jars, but um, there were colors. I, they should have picked a different color. I, you know, they're, 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 that green, <laughs> yellow. There was like squash and peas. I would I would have picked a different one. Anyway, uh, let, let's move on to something. Um, well, let's let's actually stay related to this, which is one of the things that that screams out in your book. Although I don't think you talk about it explicitly, but it's it's so out in the open is that we just know so little. <laughs> about how to raise a child. Uh, the first part of the book is just about the physical side of that. And then the, in the, toward the end of the book, there's a chapter about the psychological development. And of course, modern parents are obsessed with both of those things. We worry about whether the child's meeting the right milestones at the right places and then whether they're getting the right psychological preparation for adulthood. And it starts very young, that worry uh, for our infants. And um, what I was struck by is how, how little we know. Uh, and it, it's um, it's fascinating to me. We just it's just really hard. Well, we've uh, you know I guess you could have some psychologists on there who would say, "Oh, we know so much, and we've don't, done so many experiments." Um, but I think that because babies are not verbal and their range of motion is limited, that that we don't quite know what they're thinking and doing and how they're developing, or we think we do. We've got some mass data, but we don't really know about our own infants. And so what happens over the 20th century is there's sort of more and more surveillance of infants' psychological development as we get more and more certain that they're going to live. And that is a big transformation. Then it's the question of how are they going to live? What is their future going to be about? Uh, and so it leads down all sorts of interesting paths. I talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the popularity of astrology. You know, where were the stars aligned when your infant was born? Uh, for a while, we went through phrenology, where we tried to measure the bumps and shape of your head to say, what will that tell us about your personality and your intellect? Um, and there's still a, a tradition in some ethnic communities, as there was historically, of putting different items on the flooring and see which one the baby crawls to. Do they go? <laughs> do they go to the Bible or the whiskey? Are they going to yeah. be a preacher or a drunkard? You know, you just want to know what the future holds for your infant. Um, but we begin to be taught by psychologists that we have to, you know, surveil our babies. When do they turn their heads to follow us? Uh, when do they respond to noise? How often do they cry? Can they self-soothe and go to sleep? Uh, what age do they start walking? What age do they start babbling? They're very, very scrutinized, and they probably don't give up as much information as we'd like. Uh, and, of course, there's some funny, ex- not funny really, but some experiments I talk about uh, that psychologists conducted early on, like sticking a baby with a pen and seeing if it reacts and if you, you know this in an era when when diapers had were kept together with pins, not little straps, of course mothers would would have been able to tell them yes, when you accidentally stab your baby with a pin, they do react. Um, yeah, it's a stunning 
a stun, a stunning discovery of modern <laughs> science. Yeah. Yes, you probably know. You might have been stabbed as an infant. Oh, I was. Sure your children were not. No, correct. And I, uh, uh, the invention of Velcro and Pampers, one of the great uh, inventions of the 20th century. I know there are people who think they're environmentally unfriendly, and those are people I think who haven't thought quite enough about what cleaning a diaper does and reusing it to the environment, which is not zero. Um, I like the line you say, a 1907 baby book included a line for recording the person, recording in the in this baby book, the person who first carried an infant upstairs, the date and the baby's age at the time with the explanation, quote, it is an old superstition that a baby should be carried upstairs that it may rise in the world before it is taken downstairs. Uh, so, yeah, we had a lot of those kind of strange ideas. Uh, the other part, the other quote I want to read is uh, about the psychologist John Watson. It says, you're right, that same year he published Behaviorism and four years later, The Psychological Care of Infant and Child, in which – and this is around uh, – what year is this, Jan? Is this around 1910? I think a little later than that. Okay. Yeah. I uh, can't remember myself. Early, early part of the 20th century. It says – he advised mothers to never hug and kiss their children or let them sit on their laps. The problem was not, as other experts argued, that kissing conveyed germs, but rather it led to the creation of unhappy children. Having little faith in the abilities of mothers to rear children or to manage their own lives, Watson believed they needed scientific instruction in the psychological care of children. He viewed his book as the equivalent of Holt's 1894 manual, The Care and Feeding of Children, but it had far less influence on actual nursery practices. And a personal scandal, an affair with a graduate student he later married, forced him out of academia. His status eclipsed, he moved on to a career in advertising. Close quote. I just I just love that, uh, your um, ironic uh, ending of that, that he went from academics to advertising. I some would say it's the same field, uh, just a different <laughs> application. But uh, it is interesting, again, to make the point I made earlier that there are so many fads, it seems to me, in the psychology of how to raise our children. And you, you go through a bunch of them with terms of physical, you know, whether you should spank them or not spank them, indulge them, not indulge them, give them what they want to eat or force them to eat this other stuff, uh, keep them happy, uh, make sure they're, you know, keep their self esteem high, keep it low so they'll overcome it. All these different fads, and it, I'm calling them fads because I don't think they're much, there's much science to it. And yet today we feel like, oh, well, now we know. And it just makes you realize that we don't know so well. Yes, there is a kind of back and forth in the world of, you know, are we going to be strict? Are we going to be loving? Can you hold your baby too much? Can you not hold your baby enough? Um, we we really and we really it's very hard, of course, to subject that to any uh, data driven analysis. Yep. But it's uh, it's it's quite wonderful to to see as a historian to see the back and forth. And my favorite story about that, of course, is is Dr. Spock, who was uh, Benjamin Spock, raised in a very strict household that followed the 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 late nineteenth century expert Luther Emmett Holt. You know you rise at a certain time, you go to bed at a certain time, you eat at a certain time, uh, you keep your distance from, from the child, you don't, you know, you don't overindulge it. And then, of course, turned around and preached something very, very different after undergoing a lot of psychoanalysis <laughs> and, and really cleaving to that. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, of course, there are people who advocate things on all sides. Uh, let your baby cry to sleep. Let, you know, don't let your baby cry to sleep. Lots of bring your baby of, into the bed, bring to your bed, leave it in its own bed, sleep, put it on its stomach, put it on its back, music. No, <laughs> the one thing I found most interesting in that was when I discovered, uh, much to my surprise, that babies don't really need to be burped. Somebody in 2016, I think it was, finally did a study. Is burping good for babies? Uh, I burped my children. I'll, I'll come right out and say we, that. We you did know, too. We were burp. horrible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not horrible. Uh, but it turns out in most cultures uh, around the world, they don't burp babies. And when you do, you know, pat them on the back and help them, to, they don't need help burping. And it, they tend to throw up a little bit more when you do that. Um, but it really took till what, 2016 before we finally asked the question in the, in the United States and in the West, do babies need to be burped? And I'm, I would 
that dollars to donuts that that study published in a peer-reviewed medical journal has had no effect because we've all been taught by everyone around us to burp babies and people are probably going to continue to do that. No harm will come to the baby. Uh, We may get a little more spit up on our shoulders, but, you know, it's interesting to think about the things we do question and the things we don't. You know, my my mother, uh, grandmother to our children, uh, who's now 85, I can still see her, the pleasure she got from walk just walking around the room uh and burping our our kids just the just just the comfort she got from patting them and the art of it which she you know the satisfaction she got when it was successful it's an interesting uh human human thing Uh, that's related of course to colic and which reminds me of uh constipation uh which which take up some uh, non-trivial part of the book, not a large part, but but a part of it because it was an obsession and still is to some extent. Both of those issues, um, uh, I like uh, your line, you say, what went into infants came out of infants, making toilet training another shared concern of parents and experts. Baby book pages prompted mothers to make detailed notes as they practiced what a writer called hygienic surveillance and we, especially when you have your first child, the obsession that you have with its uh, what what goes in and what comes out, and the in between part, the colic or the burping and all that, it it what what it made me realize, which um, again I knew, but it made me realize it in a more visceral way, is how unprepared human beings are to th- to survive in the world. It's obvious uh, humans are born way too early compared to other animals, and that's because. If the gestation period was as long as it should be, which is probably something like two years, the baby could not be born. The size of the human crown, the head is too large for the hips of a delivering mother. And so babies are born even at nine months prematurely in some sense. And we're completely helpless. We're, that's obvious compared to, say, a colt or a kitten. You know, The other animals in a very short period of time can fend for themselves – we certainly can't fend for ourselves for a long time, and we seem remarkably fragile at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess I do get to talk about what comes in and out of babies. Uh, you know, Americans, and and because and I'll say this because I study uh, U.S. history, I have always been obsessed with um, uh, their digestive tracts. We'll put it that way. <laughs> And uh, you can turn on nightly television and see a lot of ads yep. uh, for for products for adults. We'll, we'll just be discreet about that. So, I appreciate but- that, Janet, very much. <laughs> I didn't often. I tell guests before an episode that that we have young listeners, and and language and and topics, certain language topics, are best kept off the program unless I warn listeners in advance, which I do. A, once in a while. Uh, I did not warn Jan. I didn't think anything was happening, but who knows? Here we are in an area that could offend some, and you, you're handling it very well, Jan. I appreciate that. Carry All on. All right. Well, <laughs> I, I went through, as I, as I point out in my book, uh, the, child, the United States Children's Bureau received up to a quarter million letters a year, uh, from mostly from women, sometimes from grandparents, sometimes from fathers, asking for advice about uh, infant and child care. Uh, They were our trusted advisors, and many, many, many of the letters were about uh, infant digestion. And uh, I I love the letters because it listed all the different products that families would try (laughs) to help their babies uh, with their digestion. But it also shows kind of an obsession with it. Uh, that that I just found fascinating. And it appears later on, I read the letter sent to Benjamin Spock. I sent read the letter, the material sent to uh, Arnold uh, Gazelle, who is an infant psychologist. Um, it, it's just a matter of great concern. And uh, I have to say the, the women physicians at the Children's Bureau handled it very well. They, <laughs> they tried to get the babies off the uh, opiate-laced products. Uh, if as a, which helped the infants to become a bit constipated. They tried to get them off other products that meant to uh, loosen them up. Um, they really just kind of believed that, in, at least in regards to evacuation, infants 
pretty much would know what they were doing. <laughs> I hope that was discreet yeah, enough. I love it. It's awesome. Uh, it, it is remarkable uh, how many things people use that were either ineffective or uh, counterproductive in, in terms of general health. Uh, but there's a special category, which we haven't talked about yet, which is um, how did cod liver oil ever become a thing and why did it die out? Uh, most of us have no experience of that. It's um, loathsome. Did it have any positive effects? And oh, yes. So oh, talk yes. about talk about what those were and, and why it died out. Well, let, let's, let's work backwards. If you have some milk in your refrigerator – it, you'll see that it has vitamin D in it. It's been uh, given a flash irradiation process that puts the vitamin D in the milk. It, um, there's a patent for that that's owned by the, uh, w- uh, for the University of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Area Research Fund. Um, but before that, people grew up without much exposure to sunlight, without making vitamin D from that sunlight. And uh, we had a, a terrible amount of rickets the softening of the bones. Um, People didn't get outside. They didn't get the sunlight. So cod liver oil was a way to deliver that to infants, to children. And then in the popular mind, it sort of took on the, like a magic elixir, you know, like uh, elixir of love. It it was uh, given out all the time to kind of boost children's health, and uh, to make sure, you know, it did help babies get stronger and healthier, and it did uh, treat the, the the rickets. But it was it was kind of seen as a, a wonderful cure, along with the idea that your baby needed a healthy tan. You also needed the natural sunlight. Yeah. So I will say, I do have a cousin who was, uh, uh, you know, his mother, my aunt told me, you know, he, she took him out in the sun every day from 12 to two to work on his tan so that he wouldn't get rickets. Uh, and it was a relatively cheap product and it was seen as so essential that, uh, it was stockpiled before the United States got into world war II. And then we turned to other, uh, forms of fish oil, uh, to, to deliver to babies. It was, uh, given out to poor children in communities all over the United States, the Indian Health Service gave it out on reservations. And people very much learned that lesson and tried to buy it for their baby. So it was a place where medicine and commercial marketing really linked arms uh, on behalf of infant health. I will, I will throw in, I've, I've given a talk about cod liver oil uh, over, in, uh, over at uh, Oxford and... Um, I learned from my British colleagues that cases of rickets have come back in the UK. They don't do the milk irradiation and children are indoors all day uh, at school or I guess on those electronic devices. So way up north where there are very few hours of sunlight uh, during the winter, they're beginning to see cases of rickets again. I don't know if they're going for the cod liver oil cure or recess, but I'm sure it will be addressed. I think I go with the recess. I, I don't think I've ever smelled cod liver oil, but based on your book, it's not a good smell <laughs> or taste. No, I, I decided not to try it out. I just believed what people said about it. I love the line where you said that the mothers were advised not to make a face when they opened it or showed it to the kid because it might <laughs> discourage the kid as if the kid couldn't figure out what it tasted like on its own. I don't know. Uh, that that seems strange. I, I, I'm just curious about this. So – uh, I'm vitamin D deficient, by the way, uh, as I think most – many Americans over the age of 12 are. Um, and I was advised to take supplements, which I decided not to for two reasons. I didn't like the side effects and uh, it wasn't obvious to me that taking vitamin D orally would have the same effect as, say, sunlight or whatever. But – and maybe that's overly skeptical. But I couldn't help thinking in, while you're talking that if you don't have vitamin D in your milk – or you don't drink milk as a, as a child, which some kids don't like it or they're lactose intolerant. Is there vitamin D in mother's milk? So if, if I'm living you – know, obviously, if I'm a kid in, in rural America, I'm outside all the time. But as urbanization grows, which is late, late 19th century through first half of the 20th is where it's dramatic, we stop spending as much time outside. Is it the vitamin D in, the, in store-bought milk that eradicated rickets in America more or less? 
It, it really had a big effect on that. Yes. Uh, your mother's mother's milk doesn't have much vitamin D. Um, and so uh, you actually, uh, uh, humans kind of evolved outdoors. And so we evolved so that I, and I believe I've got this right. And you, you'll probably hear from listeners who were telling me I've got this wrong, but you do absorb vitamin D, I think through your retina, you know, that sunlight exposure to the eyes and on your skin. So we're kind of designed to make our own vitamin D. Uh, you know, it, it no, that's for sure from sunlight. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, now we've become very sun averse. Worried about uh, skin and, cancer. No free lunch. Right. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a there's a back and forth about that now. But um, people did take their babies outside. If you think about it, living in cities, they um, uh, were living in tenements, whatever. They did try and take them outside. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, you read the part about the baby cages. Yep, lovely. You, hung a, hung a, <laughs> you put a cage outside your window, kind of stuck on the window so it wouldn't fall over, and you could put your baby out in the sunlight that way. Um, I'd be so eager to do that. I mean, that's the most <laughs> horrifying. I, 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 it's like saying – it's like having, you know, take your child to work day and your 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 dad's the window washer. You take your infant. I, I, it was just a horror. I didn't like that image at all. I didn't bring it up. Didn't like it. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we talk about how things come and go in the world of infant care, and I guess uh, that one's off, off your list. Yeah, I would have gone up to the roof so that my child would rise in the world and get the uh, sun up there. Uh, I think that would have worked fine. Right. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, your kids are all grown up, so you don't have to worry it's about too the late. baby cage. Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, uh, anyway. The other thing that struck me philosophically about reading your book, uh, which again is kind of obvious, is how much we care about our children. Uh, you know, your, your examples of the Bible versus the bottle, or they often use you describe how they'd use money to see if your kid was going to be wealthy or greedy or a business person rather than a preacher, and how much we care about what we hope they turn out to be, and how much we care about how they come out as as adults and what their um, success, happiness, meaning whatever words you want to put in there it's um it's a it's a crazy part of being human it's that we it, it's so deep within us and i know uh, it's easy to explain it's you know it's evolution or you know you can certainly uh believe it's it's divine as well but it's it's a it's kind of mysterious how much we care it's not it's one thing to say we really want them to do well we well and want them to survive we, we really want grandchildren because we're Evolution made us that way, but the amount we care is um, it's extraordinary. It is, and that is one reason why in the book I tried to balance what I what I, how we care about our babies by uh, taking out ins you know life insurance policies by opening up bank accounts for them. And I, every time I'd read the baby books from the late 1920s where they're putting all these money in the local banks for the baby, I'd like, oh, don't do it. That <laughs> bank is going to collapse. Don't you know? <laughs> don't you know? But <laughs> they, haven't seen the, they haven't seen the end of the movie. We have. It's terrible. Yeah. It's yeah. Hard. So, you know, I see that kind of investment, but I also saw, and I tried to make a point of this, what I would call the religious investment, praying for our children, enrolling them in cradle roll societies, taking them to synagogue. You know, there was a, we wanted spiritually and fiscally and in all sorts of ways to protect and learn about our children and make sure they had better lives uh, that we could see a good life for them. And that's why I was so surprised, honestly, when I start reading in the midst of the depression about save for your save for college, you know, and your baby book, it's telling you to save for college. What kind of wonderful optimism and hope does that express to us? Yeah. So I fully I fully agree with that. And the letters to the Children's Bureau, again, a wonderful statement about how much we cared and how much we wanted the best advice uh, so we could do things just right. And yes, of course, infants were abandoned. They were mistreated. Um, there's a, a full spectrum of developments there. But, but yes, the investment in infants was just wonderful and enormous. I remember when our first child came home, 
uh, there was an incredible mixture of awe at the experience and incredible fear <laughs> that 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 this creature was alive. Um, and I, I still remember that first night where she cried most of the night and every whale was – an arrow into the heart. It was like they're not going to make. She's not going to make it. It's it's horrible. She's suffering. All every emotion that that could go through. And, and of course, as some people like to point out, they don't come with a manual. Uh, despite all the advice books, you can and it's a big section in the bookstore or the library. Uh, every child is different. It's really hard to know what the right thing to do is, and it's it's such an incredible um, emotional adventure. Right. Although I guess life would have been easier for you, you know, 75 years ago when you would have said, oh, she has great lungs. She'll never get tuberculosis. <laughs> Good but point. that didn't even cross your mind because we live in a very different era. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I that's True. what I wanted to tell my readers. Yeah. I don't know if you know the work of Brian Kaplan. He's been a, he's an economist, been a guest on our program, and he has a book on on parenting where he basically argues that. Parenting doesn't matter very much. This is the flip side of what I've just tried to articulate. Parenting doesn't matter very much. Uh, they're going to turn out pretty much the way they're going to turn out overwhelmingly by their genetics. And you shouldn't worry about whether you let them cry, don't cry, change them, don't change them, feed them, don't feed them. You got to feed them. But you don't have to micromanage their uh, psychological development or their uh, much about them. They're going to be fine. And uh, have you seen that literature at all? What are your thoughts on that? I haven't looked too much. I deliberately didn't look too much at the contemporary literature and advice on that. But I did. I understand what he's trying to say, because when I read the baby books and see how babies were treated historically, and and they all seem to be just fine, despite... (laughs) um, imbibing all sorts of things, being fed all sorts of things, being denied all sorts of things. Morphine in their teething syrup. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, I'll speak, we'll speak a little about the opiates in a minute, but yes. uh, So uh, once we got over the, the big killers of infants, once we built a, uh, what I'll call a public health infrastructure where your water's clean, your milk is clean, you don't throw Hopefully, don't throw garbage in the street, and hopefully, it's picked up. You have a sewer system. Once you get past that, you really do get to the parental advice. And once you do the work of, I'm sure you wash those baby bottles. I'm sure you got the germs out of them. So there's, there's a, you know, there's parenting that does matter. Yep. Um, it's probably, you know, the psychologist might say it's good to read to your baby. Um, uh, you know, how many minutes a day, how many times a week, that's a that's a different dimension. But uh, so, um, but parents, of course, have to think that parenting matters. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not going to do any of our job, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to take them, you know, if it's 1920, we're going to be out there two hours a day if we can, getting them the nice, healthy tan. Or today, we're going to be slathering them with sunscreen so they don't have a tan. Yeah. Um, that's that's how we react to our babies, and that's an important cultural moment. Um, measuring uh, the the sun exposure and its effect in infants. Well, I'll leave that to the scientists and the physicians. Well, I like your point that those public health changes uh, and washing the bottles, say it, it's the home contribution, and and being able to economic growth obviously helped a lot. We could afford refrigerators. Uh, it was a huge change. You could keep the milk cold and everything else. Uh, the development of antibiotics. We had some, you know, glorious low-lying fruits all been picked. That's all been picked up, which is fantastic. It's all been picked. It's fantastic. It's great. Uh, you could argue that what's left is relatively small. I, I would, which is Brian's claim. I, I don't agree with him, but um, it's a provocative idea. And I do, just as an example, I love your your point that I do think you should reach your kids if not if just for your own sanity and enjoyment, but I think it probably is a, a, a good thing for them as well. But my joke used to be before I had kids, I read a book a week. Uh, after I had kids, I read a book a night, but they had a lot more pictures. Uh, and I, it, it, there is a part of your life where it just – they're a huge amount of time, and they should be, I think, uh, contrary to what Brian argues. But I think I think that's mainly a good thing. 
So I, you know, I, I think that economists need to turn away from parenting and look at the, the links between babies and the economy. You know, how much do we buy for our babies? How many working class Americans, maybe the first thing they ever went out and purchased was um, condensed milk for their babies. You know, maybe that was some of their first cash exchanges or yeah. maybe the first bank investments they made were not for themselves, but for an infant born to someone else in the family. You know, they, they are, we do things for our babies. We probably should be doing for ourselves, but don't do. Yeah. So I, I want to bring that up. And then you raise the opiate question. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, what I'm going to say is, is not by any means a defense of opiates for infants, children. <laughs> or adults. You want to say that again, just in case somebody not, missed it. <laughs> not a good idea. Uh, wow. That is my personal opinion, but I believe it is backed by a lot of medical knowledge. However, why were infants given soothing syrups? Well, let's think about the fact that if you've had a colicky or teething baby who's crying a lot, you've got other children to take care of. Uh, you've got diapers to wash on the scrub board. You've got laundry to scrub on the scrub board and hang up. You've got to keep the fire going. You've got a lot to do. Quieting a baby at that moment might seem like a very good idea. And you can tell yourself, look, the baby's sleeping. She's not in pain anymore. So the logic of doing it uh, at times is going to, outweigh the uh, consequences of feeding your baby opiates. But I'll say it again, not a good idea. But you make the right point that very hard for a modern woman or man to appreciate the challenge of running a household in, say, 1910 or 1890 with five kids where, she, you know, my knowledge of the data is about, was about a 12-hour day. Uh, to feed and and take care of the family between the laundry, laundry often had to go fetch the water. Uh, you didn't have running water, so you'd have to go down to the river, bring back a couple buckets, heat them on the stove in a big pot. You'd have to chop the somebody had to chop the wood to heat the stove usually. And you got it's not like you're alone. <laughs> you got five other, as you said, you have four or five other kids screaming or trying to get your attention or whatever they were falling down and getting hurt. Um, and so it was a, it's a very different life the way compared to what the way a 2018 parent um, with, with often a, just one kid uh, has and incredible technology to make that relatively painless. The Pampers that I mentioned are just one example. Everything else, just just hard to imagine what it was like. And, and the other thing we'll say about the Pampers or the diapers that, that we don't think about enough is they go to landfill. They're not polluting our water, we hope. Uh, they're, not, they're not piles of that rubbish out on our street. Um, so that infrastructure, that kind of invisible infrastructure is very, very important for infants. Yeah, uh, there's um, – I think some people compost their diapers also, but I think that's a, that's a high level. They're, they're pampers. It's a very okay, high level. I, I, I ne that never even occurred to me. <laughs> no, people do it. Uh, when, when we were raising our kids, it was a big issue. And I, the, the dark side of me, I'm a little more mature now, but the dark side of me used to say with a straight face, you know, we, we use disposable diapers because we care about the environment and we don't want the truck driving around town, putt, 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 polluting all the time and picking up the diapers or the, the, all the detergent that has to be used to keep the diapers clean and, and, uh, going through into our water, et cetera, et cetera. I'd say with a straight face, and, and sometimes you know people would yell at me. But um, it's 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 a it's a little more complicated than just one gets thrown away and one is reused. But that, that was my main point. Um, we're almost out of time. Anything um, you want to add about the the title of the book is that babies made us modern, and I think there's I think they are a fabulous example of how modernity has uh, can be seen i don't i don't know if i agree that they quote made us modern i know you wouldn't say that they're the only thing that made us modern but i do think what distinguishes besides all the technology and the 
small accumulation of wisdom that we've we've gotten certainly not small in terms of medical knowledge but we've gotten better at a lot of things with with respect to to bringing up babies but what what strikes me is the one of the biggest changes and I'll let you talk about it is is the focus on our children so the, the part where I agree with Brian is Brian Kaplan's work is that we're a little too obsessed I think with making sure our kids turn out okay and that often has unintended consequences, as do many well-intentioned uh, urges of, that we have. You don't talk about that because your book mainly deals – it ends around 1955, 1960. But what are your thoughts on that in terms of the modern focus, the helicopter parenting issue, and, and the extraordinary amount of time we spend now? We don't just write letters to the U.S. Children's Bureau. We buy books and – read online and magazines to try to figure out the best thing to do and often we just don't know we should just let them come out the way they're going to come out well i think the impetus to do the best we can for our infants and make sure that they have healthy happy productive lives is the same um we i think maybe we spend our time worrying more, perhaps because we're away from our children more. We're, we're at work, so we have to worry about uh, what goes on when we're not there. Uh, so rather than being there with our children, and that was kind of invisible work and worrying that we, that we didn't see. Uh, but I'm always impressed, really, at how much worrying, did when I read the baby books, how much worrying and surveillance did go on. People weighing their babies several times a day. Is that any different than listening to the baby monitor or, you know, the devices that we now use to track when infants in their cribs roll over? I think it comes from the same place. Uh, in terms of modernity, uh, what I really want to say in the book is, no, we're not, babies are not railroads. They're not <laughs> modern uh, factories. They don't create modernity in the same way, but they certainly create what I would call ordinary they allow ordinary families to connect to that modern world more concretely, to open a bank account, to buy things, to pay attention to new medicine and science and psychology. So I like to see them as kind of the, the connecting link, if, if not the drivers of modernity. My guest today has been Janet Golden. Her book is Babies Made Us Modern. Janet, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>